Good evening, Assalamu alaikum, and welcome to Sports Extra. I'm your host, Ahmed Nawaz. Tonight, we're going to start off with the ICC T20 Cricket World Cup 2021. And I think the top story is going to be India up against New Zealand. Now, we expect India to bounce back. You know, being very neutral, being true cricket fans, we know they've got the potential, they've got the ability, they've got the talent. But something was just not there for Team India last night. It was New Zealand all the way, first restricting India uh, to a total that didn't feel like that it was Team India batting first. And even though I think they were under a lot of pressure, we still expected them to at least show the intent that they're in this match. But they looked completely haywire. So we'll be discussing about that. New Zealand's strength as well. They went into this match uh, with a bit of confidence as well. They had lost to Pakistan, of course, but they were a lot more confident than India going into this match. So we've got to discuss this as well. And obviously, I think we talk about India being our monkey on the back in ICC tournaments that we've taken off. But uh, New Zealand seemed to be uh, the monkey on India's back right now in ICC tournaments. So I think we'll discuss that. Virat Kohli's post-match press conference in which we, he said that we lack bravery. So that too you know the definition of bravery itself what does that mean uh, then obviously in a, a pressure situation changing your entire uh, I mean if not your entire batting order but making a prime change where Rohit and KL Rahul have been there for Team India and then just putting Ishan Kishan in there and even though you do that you still have Rohit and Kohli at 3 and 4 then why couldn't you get the start that you wanted because it had to be all guns blazing so you added a bit of strength in your batting and depth as well so we'll be discussing all about that after that uh, a game that we talk about is England up against Sri Lanka that is of course tonight with the action live on PTV Sports from 7 p.m. the toss at 6.30 England have been dominating the T20 World Cup in their group so we've got to talk about their campaign as well and uh, the aggressive brand of cricket that they're playing and definitely people are predicting a Pakistan England final although I think it's too early to call this cricket is a funny game especially T20 cricket knockout stages you never know and in the second half of the show we'll be discussing football English Premier League uh, about some time now, we'll discuss a couple of games, including Manchester United, Spurs, Chelsea uh, with Newcastle, and also Liverpool against Brighton as well, and also the upcoming fixture of United against City, which is a Manchester derby. We'll be discussing all about this in tonight's show. Time now to introduce my guest in studios. I've been joined by cricket expert Rizwan Haider. Assalamu alaikum. How are you, sir? I'm good, thank you. Good to have you on the show. We've also been joined by a fellow anchor, a very dear brother, and also a cricket enthusiast and expert as well, Ali Gohar. Ali, assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Sports Extra. Wa alaikum assalam. You can hear me. I can hear you just fine. Uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Rizwan. First of all, what happened last night? It was something incredible that was going on. I think uh, the pressure... You know, I think India has not been able to recover from that Shaheen Afridi mm -hmm. delivery to Rohit Sharma. And, you know, that's literally, it's, uh, you know, they've been playing IPL for the last month or so, practicing in Dubai, in Sharjah. I just don't know. Uh, they're a big team. They're, they're uh, you know, man-to-man. -man, they're a better batting unit than Pakistan, mm -hmm. of course. And they're a be better batting unit than New Zealand or anyone, uh, other than probably England have uh, got a very strong team. Mm -hmm. I'm just shocked. I think they've, they've been shell-shocked by what happened against Pakistan and they've just not been able to recover. They were literally not positive at all. There was no body energy you could see. Uh, there's no positive energy and uh, I think uh, probably the media as well. Mm -hmm. There's too much pressure on the media because I think they've already, they had already won the World Cup in their minds before it even started. You know, that's the biggest problem. If you're it's a bit funny that it's, it's a sort of situation that we've been in where Pakistan, whenever they lost to India, could never get back up. But you don't expect that from India because they're a side that have always bounced back strong. Well, it's nice to be in a position like that. You know, <laughs> we've always been playing, you know, X beats Y and Z beats A. And then, you know, <laughs> there's rain in one of the other games and then we probably might just make it. And that's the position that India is in right now. Uh, it's unfortunate for the game of cricket. As a, as a cricket enthusiast, you would love to see India, you know, going mm -hmm. forward. Uh, we're not anti-India. Uh, as a sportsman, it's disappointing, you know, when you've got such a good team and uh, I think there are two other problems that need to be addressed. You know, they'd already decided before the tournament, if you remember last time we discussed how mm -hmm. Virat Kohli is under pressure as a Absolutely. captain, they'd already decided before the tournament that that's his last game, mm -hmm. that last tournament as captain. You know, when you're on your notice period in an, any, any job, you know, you take it easy, you're, you're not that focused. You know, it had been much better for India had they decided that if they win the tournament, then Kohli goes and says, you know, I've done the job, thank you very much, I'm Unleaving, out. Yeah. Or he had lost and he'd said, you know, I've, I've made an effort, uh, couldn't do it, now somebody else should come mm -hmm. and do it. But uh, 
pre-deciding in in the in the tournament, you know, before going into the tournament, saying, you know, we've uh, that's his last tournament as the captain. That's just not the way. That's not the way, indeed. Ali Gaur, for someone like you who has uh, been keenly watching Indian cricket develop with their structure, their talent, and obviously then the brilliance that uh, Mahindra Singh Dhoni brought to the team, and then Kohli continued that as well. Uh, in your mindset, what do you think went wrong last night? Do you also believe that it's just the pressure of losing to Pakistan that is still there? Then, of course, there are talks which I think are rubbish that they had uh, scheduling concerns. But And then, of course, there's a factor that they had about six to seven days uh, in their next game against New Zealand uh, with Pakistan. So maybe that uh, mental depressive phase or that thought process was still continuing. Well, firstly, before I start, I, I just heard uh, Rizwan Heather speak, and I think he summed it up quite beautifully. It's refreshed. It's nice to hear a, a voice of sanity, and that's unusual, especially during World Cup. So I was really enjoying listening to him. Uh, secondly, uh, just coming back to your point, Emma, look, it's a number of issues. Yes, they were badly beaten by Pakistan. They were the favorites, a 10-wicket loss. It's never easy to recover from. New Zealand... Their first game against Pakistan, which they lost, but they were they were tested. Whereas India had a six seven day break, and 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 that um, you know I, I can imagine how, how how difficult that must be for a team. You know, with all the pressure and coming from a country like India and Pakistan have faced similar situations, uh, it, it couldn't have been easy for them. They hadn't had any cricket under the uh, under their belt after their defeat against Pakistan. Whereas New Zealand had been properly tested against a quality team. And there was panic in the ranks. And you saw that, and I think Ahmed, you highlighted it well, that uh, uh, Ishan Kishan coming in uh, to, to open the batting. It just didn't make any sense to me. That was very uh, un-India, very unlike uh, uh, Virat Kohli and this uh, Indian think tank. So I found that, I found that off. Uh, I don't think there's anything serious. I don't think there's anything amiss. It's two games. They lost two games against two very good teams. Uh, these uh, these things happen. This Indian team is a is is very strong. They've got they've got fa uh, fantastic players. I, I think it's just, I think it's just one of those things. Yes, they weren't very positive uh, when they came out there. Kohli said it himself. Uh, we weren't uh, we weren't brave enough. We weren't positive enough. Positive enough. They were they were overly circumspect, which is what not what you associate with. Uh, an Indian team, and you mentioned uh, the the likes of Dhoni and Dhoni's legacy. But you know, it's a, this had to happen at some point. You usually see India doing doing well in BCC's tournaments, but you also see New Zealand doing well. So I, I don't think this needs to be uh, overly analysed either. But like I said, for, for like Rizwan was saying for Pakistanis, it's a such unfamiliar territory. You know, we're usually used to losing to India and then watching their you know right wing. Uh, media channels are not going Swami going, the nation wants to know why Pakistan keep losing to India. So this is very unfamiliar territory and I'm quite enjoying it. Definitely. It's, it's a bit funny at the same time as well. But discussing that, we know that Pakistan is more or less going to qualify uh, considering no unfortunate scenario takes place there. But, uh, you know, the chances of other teams going through and what should be the case for them, we've got a report on that. Let's just take a look and then I'll come back. With Pakistan on top of the Group 2 of ICC Men's T20 World Cup, here is how things stack up for the three teams, New Zealand, Afghanistan and India, which are likely to be fighting for the second slot to the semi-finals of the tournament. With a total of two matches played and zero points on the table, India has a net run rate of 1.609, with three matches remaining against Afghanistan, Scotland and Namibia. India's only chance now is to win their three remaining games and then hope that New Zealand and Afghanistan lose at least one of their remaining games then net run rates could come into play. Even on that front, India is below par, so their fate is much out of their hands for this tournament. New Zealand, on the other hand, has played a total of two games and with two points on the table has a net run rate of 0.765. It is yet to face Scotland, Namibia and Afghanistan in its three remaining matches. If they win their remaining games, they will qualify regardless of other results. Among the three remaining opponents, Afghanistan is easily the toughest and if they lose that game, they could still miss out on qualification. 
elimination, depending on other results. And the schedule for the next three games isn't the easiest, as they play day games with one day gap at three different venues against Scotland in Dubai on November 3rd, against Namibia in Sharjah on November 5th, and against Afghanistan in Abu Dhabi on November 7th. Afghanistan has four points, playing a total of three games having a net run rate of 3.097. It is yet to face India and New Zealand. Afghanistan has done their best to maximize the gains from their matches against Scotland and Namibia, which is why their net run rate is sitting pretty at 3.097. The two remaining games for them are against two of the bigger teams, India and New Zealand. If they win both, they will qualify. If they lose to India and beat New Zealand, then run rates will probably come into play. Afghanistan's schedule could be an advantage as they beat Namibia in Abu Dhabi and they stay there for the last two games as well. Well, there you have it, that report courtesy Kainat Amil telling us how teams can qualify definitely. And uh, obviously, we do know that it's not going to rain in the UAE. So the scenarios are pretty much straightforward and pretty tough for teams like India. Uh, but that being said, you know, I've had many guests on Sports Extra. We've discussed cricket a lot at many times. But uh, like Ali Gaur was saying that Rizwan is making a lot of sense. I've also figured out something that uh, he's been doing a lot of homework. He's got this entire research in front of him. And I see that you've got different things that, that you've been working on. But why why am I seeing Pakistan-Afghanistan as a final? What, what does that mean? No, no. Uh, well, on, uh, on a lighter note, you know, if Afghanistan, and I'm sure uh, India is under a lot of pressure, uh, it's not, it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. You know, mathematically, they're top of the table uh, after Pakistan with the, with a net run rate. And if they can beat India, because India is under so much pressure, and New Zealand, I'm sure, you know, in the mm. last game we discussed, Afghanistan would be tricky. And they literally took the game from us. If you see the Pakistan game, had it not been for Asif Ali, uh, we, were, we could have been uh, mm -hmm. you know, shock victims. So uh, there's a possibility. It's New Zealand and Afghanistan who are very much in frame for a semi-final berth. Mm. You know, and uh, if that's the case uh, with their spin attack, you know, even if they face England in the semi-final, you could have a Pakistan-Afghanistan final. Why mm. not? Mm. You know, it's just because Afghanistan does not have that aura of India or England or Australia that we're taking them lightly. But they were automatic qualifiers, weren't they? I mean, Sri Lanka had to qualify, uh, uh, Bangladesh had to qualify, but they made it on their own. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can't take them lightly, especially on these wickets where, you know, you've got three... It's a home surface for them anyway. They play there them. most of the time. They're practicing there as well. Yes, yeah, so they're, they're not out. I'm, I'm hoping they, you know, they're in with a shout. They're in with a shout as well. Uh, you know, to, we've talked about this group uh, as well, but because we, we're focusing on the other one as well, because we want to see most probably who we're getting in the semifinals. But... Let's talk about England, the brand of cricket that they've been playing. What does that suggest to the entire world right now? Actually, I think they're the most complete team. You know, if you look at their batting, you know, with uh, uh, Jason Roy and Barristow and uh, Butler. Butler and everyone, you know, Morgan, uh, Moeen Ali, Livingston, mm -hmm. and their bowling. You know, they've got three spinners, uh, Adil Rashid, uh, Moeen Ali and uh, Livingston. Uh, Wokes is doing wonderfully well. Uh, so is Jordan. I think they're the most complete team. They're, uh, if you look at just the teams, you know, they're the strongest team in the mm -hmm. world right now because you know victories have covered our weaknesses like the brittle middle, middle order that we have. Other than that, it's very disappointing. You know, we were saying it's the group of death, group mm -hmm. of death, but it has turned out to be the group of the dead. Mm. You know, there's no fight. A team so like West Indies, I mean, Bangladesh. You know, what, a, what a disappointment. You know, we were hoping they, they're playing worse than, you know, club cricket teams. Mm like who play, uh, who play without any money like You'd Sunbury Village. you Namibia is playing well. Namibia is actually mm. putting up a fight. You know, they've, uh, they've beaten Scotland. They qualified. They were not even expected to qualify. Uh, it's very, very disappointing that people, probably I think it's financial concerns that, you know, you make more money in certain leagues and you play. Uh, but otherwise, you know, national pride should be the main thing. And mm. I just don't see that in, in Bangladesh, in West Indies. Even the uh, Sri Lanka-South Africa game, very close. But, you know, the totals, I think teams are going in batting first uh, and thinking, you know, 200 is the target. Mm -hmm. They're not analyzing the wickets. Well, 150 can be safe. Where 160 or 155 mm. or 65 would be a better to target to begin with. But, you know, you have to go in, analyze for a couple of overs and then go for a target. But if you go with a preconceived notion that, you know, 205 is the target that I'm High aiming for. High intensity game, yeah. Exactly. You mm. know, that's just not possible. It's not IPL. <laughs> it's not, you know... You know, the problem with IPL is, and other leagues, IPL has four international players per team, mm -hmm. two local stars because it's a 15-man squad mm -hmm. and they've got eight teams. So you've got six world-class players 
but the rest of the five, you know, that means you've got uh, at least a couple of bowlers who are weak, a couple of batsmen who are, you know, that good. So playing an IPL and thinking that, you know, you're going to be world beaters, it's just not on. It's just not on. I think the structure is something that needs to be looked at once again back to the drawing board and definitely that's why we stress the importance of having international cricket a priority than leagues as well. Ali Goy, your thoughts about this group that we're talking about because I think uh, we expected more from West Indies at least. We expected more because they've won two World Cups and also because they have a, they have a very good T20 team. I mean, a packed powerhouse of, of such uh, wonderful players and they really challenged Australia uh, in the Caribbean. They did brilliantly against the Australians and I thought their spinners like Hayden Walsh Jr. and uh, uh, the left arm spinner would, 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 would make an impact and do some damage but that clearly didn't happen. Their batting really uh, let them down and because of, as Rizwan, Rizwan was alluding to it, the nature of the tracks doesn't really these, Abu, these UAE wickets don't really suit the West Indian batsman because the ball doesn't quite come on. You have to grind and graft. And that's not really their game. So, in a way, I'm not surprised that uh, the West Indians have faltered. England wasn't talked about enough, I think. Uh, and they have, I mean, I mean, if you look at their side, I mean, it's so balanced. They're bowling back. I mean, Chris Wokes, I mean, across formats is fantastic. He bowled brilliantly in the last game against Australia. Timal Mills, a fantastic death bowler. Uh, Chris Jordan executes his Yorkers more often than not. We talk about Afridi and Boomra, but Jordan is right up there when it comes to uh, bowling Yorkers. And then the two spinners, Adil Rashid, Moin Ali, and then batsmen like Roy, uh, 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 Bairstow, the captain Morgan. Granted, he's not in the best of form, but there's just they have so many options. So I think England uh, have, have done very, very well, and they're going to be even more dangerous going forward. Yes, um, history suggests that in World Cups, England do succumb under pressure. Go back to the 2016 uh, World Cup when Carlos Brathwaite hit those sixes against Ben Stokes, 50 over cricket, the 92 World Cup uh, against, uh, against Pakistan. But this England side, uh, they, they know how to handle pressure. And I think they have the right team uh, for these conditions. So it'll be interesting to see how, how they fare deeper into into this World Cup. Yeah, there's a very particular point that, you know, I, I would like to inquire about, and it's that that's about uh, reliance on a particular player, Rizwan. For example, India have done that with Virat Kohli a lot. Pakistan has tend to be the same with Babar Azam. But now, because in the last game, uh, we saw Babar going out cheaply and the other guys taking responsibility, you think, and the game is going down to the wire, do you think it's good that the quality of the side gets tested and obviously the second part would be that moving on to a game against Scotland and Namibia which we should not take easy I think they're still international games take them like that uh, do you believe that there needs to be a certain experiments right now or not I actually don't think so mm -hmm. I mean you you know you uh, want to test your team uh, it's already there uh, they're going to be playing in the semi-final anyway mm -hmm. so uh, you know Heather Ali and others are having nets so it's not an issue but uh, I agree with uh, uh, Gohar, you know, England is a complete team. Mm -hmm. They're one of the best right now. And uh, but the only thing that uh, uh, the problem with India is, and England, the media. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when I was in England, in England, uh, whenever the football comes in, you know, the, all the papers are filled where the football's coming home and all that. And they do the same with every sport, cricket as well. If you put too much pressure, the expectation goes high. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let them just relax and play their natural game. England is doing that right now. But, you know, whenever the finals come or semifinals, uh, with experience, we know South Africa are genuine chokers. But England also get... Uh, is that why were we so good against India? Because we had, like, no expectation this time, probably. We <laughs> actually didn't, isn't it? I mean, We had nothing to lose. I mean, 12 <laughs> games on the trot. What more can, can there be? You know, they were, we were bound to win mm. once, once in a while, but we didn't. Or since 1992, that started in 92. Absolutely. Since 92 till 2021, you know, um, you know, we've become old <laughs> men now, <laughs> and uh, it was a once in a lifetime thing. So uh, I think India was not expecting it, mm. and uh, that's the reason that uh, you know we're in this position because this is un un uncharted territory for us. Mm. On a lighter side, uh, how's your mother-in-law? Uh, she's wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. So uh, I'm sure she took your comments very... Uh, she was saying hello to you as well, <laughs> inviting you for dinner. <laughs> well, I guess both of us are going to get it now, not just you. So, 
Well, uh, he's trying to find a wingman as well. But uh, Ali Gaur and Rizwan, thank you so much for being on the show. It was a pleasure having you on this segment. We're just going to go towards a short break, but stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Sports Extra with me, Ahmed Nawaz. Time now for our football segment. Before we go any further, we've got a report on the English Premier League. Let's take a look. Cristiano Ronaldo was the inspiration behind an excellent United display as they beat Tottenham by 3-0. Ronaldo made life much more comfortable for his boss with a sublime volley from Bruno Fernandes cross six minutes before the break. Ronaldo's goal was followed by a slide rule pass to set up Edinson Cavani for a second goal after 64 minutes. Marcus Rashford wrapped things up with a cool finish four minutes from time as Spurs fans erupted in fury against their manager Nuno. Whereas Jurgen Klopp's team squandered a two-goal lead against Brighton. Two goals down after 24 minutes, Ryden never wavered in their positivity, composure or belief in their manager's methods. Ryden showed real character to get it back to 2-2 before looking the more likely side to score a late winner. On the other hand, Reese James scored twice to help Premier League leader Chelsea beat Newcastle United at a packed St. James Park. James blasted the ball into the roof of the net after Hudson Odoi's cross was headed into his path to put the visitors ahead after 65 minutes. It became 2-0 12 minutes later when James struck again powerfully past goalkeeper Carl Darlow. Darlow then fouled Kai Havertz to give Chelsea a penalty with Jorginho converted for a third goal. Wilfred Zaha's early goal and Conor Callagher's late finish gave Crystal Palace a deserved victory over Manchester City at Etihad Stadium. Callagher set up Zaha for the first goal, winning the ball in the City half and then playing the winger in as he scuffed his shot aimed well enough to beat Edison. Then in the closing minutes, Michael Lolais raced down the right flank before playing in Zaha, who as the chance was closed down, calmly waited to play the ball back to the substitute and he quickly teed up Callagher, who slammed home off the post. There you have it. All you need to know about the Premier League, discussing this further and of course some other updates about football. In studios, we've been joined by football expert and youth coach Sabil Hazir. Aslam alaikum, how are you? Welcome, Aslam Ahmed. I'm well, thank you for having me. Thank you for being on the show. I've not seen you for a couple of days. It was you know, a bit of a, a missing feeling. So, uh, but anyways, how have you found the Premier League, particularly start off with United because Ole did have himself on the line this time, but he got the better of Spurs. Well, great weekend if you're a Chelsea fan, but a very good Premier League weekend. There was a lot of action, a lot of surprising results. For United, if we start off there, uh, look, both managers were under a lot of pressure, both Nuno for Spurs mm. and Solskjaer for United. And I think uh, Solskjaer obviously got the win, a comprehensive one. He needed it as well, but that's obviously going to mount a lot of pressure on Nuno. But the advantage is uh, for him that he's got some easier fixtures coming up. I think he's got Vitesse in European competition and Everton on the weekend, whereas United now at City in the league and at Atalanta in the Champions League. But very, very, uh, I think this was the one of the three games that they had to win was Spurs because the other two, I think, will give them a tougher time. Uh, uh, when I was in a talk with Hassan uh, in the other show in the mm -hmm. afternoon, he mentioned something very particular about the talk of uh, whether uh, they're going to get uh, somebody else at United or not. Mm -hmm. But obviously, that person hasn't come. But he mm -hmm. said the strategy of that person was being implemented because Ole went with a completely different formation that, that would have been implemented by somebody else. So, that's really interesting because he went three at the back. We all saw that, which is very interesting. Uh, but that with it, that causes another problem because where do you fit Sancho into this mm. system? He was already struggling since he came here from Dortmund and now he's already come into a disjointed system. Now you're trying three at the back and you're experimenting with that. But maybe because of the pressure, they've decided to go and maybe give it a whirl, show him, show, maybe Solskjaer is thinking, if I can show I can work this three at the back and I can play this system that they don't need to bring anybody else in. But I think he'll get some limited success with this and then eventually the cracks will begin to show. There's something about him, Sabil, and... Uh, as a footballer, maybe you can comment on this better that, you know, even in his statement, he said that he would not let these couple of things define 
him at Manchester United because obviously he's been a player, uh, if not a club legend, he's been there for the team, he's been there in the Champions League, he's done everything. But this coaching stint, he doesn't want it to define his career, something that has went awfully with the likes of Gerard. It's or Lampard, sorry. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so yeah. people have uh, short memories. Obviously, we don't. Uh, it's very easy to forget how much of a legend he was and the things he has won. Mm. People need to understand. Solskjaer was a serial winner as a player, but his managerial career will speak in terms of a story completely different to that. So he's got to live with that. You rolled the dice. You wanted to go into management. You took an opportunity to come back to your your club united and take on this ma massive role with very little experience so it's not really up to him whether it defines him or not now it will define him as a manager united this is something which he might never be able to get over mm. so he has to start getting the results because i think this could affect him very negatively and as much as you know those of us who have seen him play would love to think of Solskjaer just as the guy the super sub the definition of a super sub for an entirely new generation, he's just the guy who could never win it with United. Mm. And if you look at the game against Spurs, both teams had such massive gaps that any top side would have ripped them apart. <laughs> it's just lucky for them that they were playing each other. Mm. That's so. true, that's true. One of them had to be the better side in terms of those two with their failed attempts as well. Uh, Chelsea, you commented, it, um, had a better weekend than the rest of the teams, obviously. It's a dream run for them right now. Uh, Chelsea, I think, especially with the teams around them dropping points, Massive win and to do it in such emphatic fashion. They always the Chelsea Newcastle. I don't know about for other people. For me, it's always an incredible game to watch. Whether it was those goals that CC scored against them or the way Chelsea, when they beat them, dominate them sometimes, it's always a good game to watch. And Rhys James, like not just him, like all of the Chelsea wing backs mm -hmm. are having incredible seasons. Like they're getting goals, they're always up in the final third, causing trouble. You know, we spoke a lot about Trent and Robertson when they were on that Champions League run and yeah. that league run. When you start talking about these guys in that same breath, because if they can keep this up the whole season, I mean, it's incredible. Two uh, goals for Reese James, uh, incredible game. They dominated possession. They had like close to 70% or around that in possession. And um, Reese James probably should have been given the penalty to complete his hat trick, although I know why Jorginho took it. But they Definitely. should have given it to yeah, but I also <laughs> felt that, that maybe he deserved it. But you also believe that Newcastle is still a team that uh, was to survive relegations and needs major transfers when they go into January? They need a massive restructuring, no doubt. Uh, years of uh, Mike Ashley, they need to get over now. But um, in January, when they come, they obviously can't do the massive restructuring. They're just going to need to go out and buy a few, like, really top, uh, maybe not massive names, but solid, dependable players. They've got the resources now. Now they've got the resources. Yeah. So maybe buy two to three players in January. Uh, get City's academy director. I don't know if they've completed that yet, but they wanted to get their academy director. Get that in place as soon as possible. Because Newcastle, when you're talking about youth football, they have an, they are one club city. This is the biggest club in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. So they can, they need to start uh, focusing on that. Because then, if you put the resources in, you have all that talent, young talent at your disposal. But yeah, two or three signings come in January. I think they have the players like Saint Ma Alex St. Maximan and Almiron who can do enough of a job to make them survive in the next season. Let's see what happens. The well, Breeble you, starts. You mentioned a very interesting point and that opens up a big debate that it, sometimes it's not just about scouting players through international football. Mm -hmm. It's about having a good home base as well yeah. where you're producing footballers. Mm -hmm. So... There was a talk a while back about Celtic in range, this is maybe a decade ago this talk has been going on, about them dropping into the English lowest tier and starting from there and actually playing in England because mm. Welsh teams play in the Premier Absolutely. League as well. And uh, the biggest talk there was like, look, they wouldn't even if they don't have the capacity right now, because they have such amaz amazing youth systems and mm -hmm. they bring so much talent from across the country, in 20 years or 15 years, they'll be able to compete at the highest level of the Premier League. Newcastle already in the Premier League. They already have a monopoly on new talent in that region. They just need the resources to bring in a few more kids from around and maybe give those kids more opportunities as well and also uh, bring in better staff, you know, higher level staff. And I think they have, Newcastle is the perfect club to go and set up a youth structure, uh, to revolutionize a youth structure and bring in phenomenal talent through. I think Newcastle is a perfect club. For Klopp them. and his boys a bit frustrated with that draw, or do you think it they was? Des they deserved to drop points mm. I think I looked at that game and their press was very good and they were creating very well and uh, they were doing well in the attacking third but they were, I don't know if they were tired or they were lazy but if you look at the way they were defending they were jogging back for everything yeah. uh, you can actually look at Van Dijk and the rest of these guys we know are quick for especially for <laughs> center halves and it's taken them ages to get back now the goal that was scored uh, uh, by Brighton that scream it reminds me of like goals Yaya Touri used to score yeah. for City side foot whips from mm. outside the box there's nobody around, like who's running to him? Like who's running to mark it? They were so slow to mark their men mm -hmm. and they weren't getting any of the midfield runners, right? So I think they, 
as well as they attacked and they were lucky with a few offside goals. Uh, I think by the end of it, with Trossard being called offside for his second goal of the game, they were lucky to get a draw at the end because they were so lazy or tired in defence. Maybe it's harsh to call them lazy, mm. but they seemed very lethargic in the back. Very lethargic indeed as well. Now, we've got to talk about, I, I personally want to talk about City because mm -hmm. we've got a Manchester <laughs> derby coming up. And I, I don't know why I don't want to say this on live television, but I, I, I think going into mm. that game, we might just feel Liverpool had us easy. And I think City might just completely annihilate United. I think... Uh, People shouldn't take what happened at this weekend as a sign of like City. It's just one slip <laughs> yeah. up. They are still, you know, they, I think they might demolish United because look, Laporte, foolish red card because he had cover coming in when he had brought the uh, was it Zaha down, but um, needless, needless, absolutely. needless. Like I get why you think I'm the last man, but there's about 20 yards between you and the goal, and you have cover coming in on uh, behind you. But anyway. Um, they have stones coming in though. They've got a guy who kept Laporte out of the team for a full season. So they're not going to be missing Laporte too much. And attacking-wise, we know how much talent they have. And I think United, the gaps they showed against Spurs, you show mm. that. They have so, like a little bit of time. If they can improve on this system a little bit and they get like they, uh, and they get Ronaldo firing and Cavani and Ronaldo working as a two, which it's seeming to do, then yeah, maybe if City play as sloppy as they did uh, on the weekend and United get a bit of luck, they could win. But chances are City will not be as sloppy and United will show the same gaps and then that might cause issues. Well, we know that they might have their success rate in everything that Manchester City has enjoyed over the years. But once it's a Manchester derby, even Guardiola would want this very badly because he wants oh. to prove a point to at least his fans. Yeah. And we know that he's not had a subtle relationship with his <laughs> fans right now. 100% he's had a few, uh, back and forth going with the fans. But uh, he, uh, I think they need to bounce back in the league. It's all well and good getting results in the Champions League, but you also then the league need to bounce back. After the loss at this weekend, their fans will be like, look, you need to beat United. They have had one, they've had this performance against Spurs. Mm. They are our biggest rivals in terms of the, this is the derby. Uh, and City need to bounce back. And I think Guardiola will really want to prove a point. But knowing Guardiola and the way he kind of coaches, if you've seen him long enough, you know he never really changes his game plan. He has a lot of faith in the system. So I don't think we should be expecting anything too outlandish from him. You know, a few, maybe a few tweaks here and there. But it'll be the Guardiola system. And let's see if Solskjaer trusts this three at the back and does it again next week. Definitely. Finally, before I close the show, I've got two questions from the people mm -hmm. uh, who really want to ask Saville okay. and uh, you know you can use that hashtag next time ask Saville. Uh, number one uh, people want to know is Ole going to go and number two what do you think about the sacking of Komen? I think uh, as for, for Ole uh, I think the I said this before as well I think they'll give him till the end of the season I think they have to get somebody else I think unless he wins a trophy like which we could do you know strange stuff has happened but unless he does that they have no reason to keep him uh, the squad he has right now should be doing a lot better. So I think till the end of the season, they wouldn't maybe they'll disrespect him, but I don't think they will by sacking yeah. him. As for uh, the Barcelona job, uh, long time coming, I think he's been very vocal and very controversial in the press as well. He said a lot of things about Messi as well, which is like, look, if you're at Barcelona, even if Messi's left, no, you, you don't, don't talk so about <laughs> Lionel Messi like he's just an afterthought. He is. Yeah. He was Barcelona, you know. So I think Ronald Koeman had to go. I think um, if they get Xavi, well and good. Uh, and I think it is... I don't like it when I say Sakya manages the right move for a club because the guy's just lost his job. But it seems to be that this is inevitable and for Barcelona to move forward, they need to get rid but of him. Yeah, but look at it this way. Maybe United have got another option to consider after Kuhn <laughs> being sacked. Well, yeah, at least he's a ex more experienced manager. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then obviously, sir, the Barcelona fans will be more concerned about the news about Sergio Aguero, you know, with his heart condition and stuff. Yeah. So, hopefully, he's all right and things. But, yeah, for United fans, I think they'd take Ronald Koeman over Solskjaer. Definitely. Zabil, thank you so much for joining us. Always much. great having you on the show. That's all we have time for for this edition of Sports Extra from me and the entire team. It's goodbye for now.